Welcome to the Painter Marketing Mastermind Podcast, a show created to help painting company owners build a thriving painting business that does well over $1 million in annual revenue. I'm your host, Brandon Pierpont, founder of Painter Marketing Pros and creator of the popular PCA educational series, Learn, Do, Grow, Marketing for Painters. In each episode, I'll be sharing proven tips, strategies, and processes from leading experts in the industry on how they found success in their painting business. We will be interviewing owners of the most successful painting companies in North America and learning from their experiences. In this very special episode of the Painter Marketing Mastermind podcast, we host a group interview of Nick Slavic, Brad Ellison, Chris Elliott, and Chris Mole, all owners of highly successful painting companies. These titans of industry discuss topics that were covered during Nick Slavic's Ask a Painter Live Winter Retreat in Minnesota, during which time only a small group of people were privy to this great information. This lively debate and exchange of ideas demonstrates that while there are certain important themes that seem to be consistent among highly successful painting companies, there are oftentimes multiple paths that painting company owners can follow to achieve that success. If you want to learn more about the topics we discussed in this podcast and how you can use them to grow your painting business, visit paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast for free training, as well as the ability to schedule a personalized strategy session for your painting company. Again, that URL is paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast. All right. So we have a very special edition of the Painter Marketing Mastermind podcast. We're doing a bit of a repeat from our live podcast recording at the PCA Expo 2022. There was a bit of an issue with the audio, uh, may or may not be released, but uh, we have a lot of guests here who are kind enough to lend themselves, lend their time again. So we have Brad Ellison from Somerset Painting. We have Chris Elliott from Onnit Painting. We have Chris Mole from Mr. Mole's Painting and Nick Slavic, from, what, what is Nick's company again? Oh, Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration. Almost, almost forgot the name of that one. Um, and we are going to talk about limiting beliefs. We were all in attendance at a very in-depth retreat that Nick Slavic put on, Ask a Painter Live Winter Retreat. Uh, the, there was some extremely in-depth conversation, up to an hour per person, about 20 people there. So the depth was impressive, um, what we uncovered. So which of you gentlemen kind of want to kick this off? We kick it off about, should well, we kick it off about limiting beliefs and or should we uh should we talk about we can do limiting beliefs we can do really whatever I guess what whatever I learned about, or, yeah kind of whatever was talked uh, about maybe at the retreat however you feel like you want to start it right yeah so limiting beliefs I thought it, it, it's a um yeah, it's, it's something that limits you, right? So what I learned and what I took away from the um, the winter retreat getaway was that um, it's all about mindset, you know, that it's, it's not about intelligence and it's not about skill. It's not about hard work, you know? It's about the mindset. And, uh, and that if something isn't working, um, you've got to change the way you, you think about it. And it, and it's hard, you know, because you have to retrain your mind to attack problems from a different point of view. And I learned this from listening to people like you guys that are more successful than I am. Dumber people than me have had more success than me with less work to get there because of their mindset, you know? Um, yeah, and... I just, uh, it opened a complete new perspective um, on limiting beliefs for me and how it's all revolved around how you, how you perceive it, you know? Chris, so I, if, I can, if I can interject, so are you saying that you think that success of people in, in this industry or any other is being able to conquer limiting beliefs and doesn't, did you say it doesn't have anything to do with skill or hard work? I think it's all about your mindset, you know. I mean, skill and hard work. I think it's. I think it's. If if you have it like a a mindset of like perseverance and grit and like never give up attitude. Yeah, I mean, I'm as I'm as dumb as a box of nails, you know. And <laughs> not being able to. I, I don't buy it. To, I don't buy that. <laughs> no. 
No, I've been able to run a pretty successful lean company in a, in a real small populated area because I, I listen to people that have, that, are, that have had the success, you know, and just uh, mimicked it and put my own little, um, little twist on it. I mean, from, from Brad, from Chris, I mean, the leadership, Nick, systems, I mean, all you guys are... are like really mean a lot to me you know and i listen to you guys so chris Moore, well, I would, I would ag- oh go ahead brett well i would agree that mindset mindset is a critical factor in being able to take a business from you know modest modest performance to exploding it like a lot of the guys we hang out with have right mm-hmm. uh I, I think that but you, you can't just have the mindset i would say you you have to have the skill and the hard work and skill to your point, Chris Mull, skill and hard work will get you to a certain point, but the mindset, you know, getting rid of that, uh, that limiting belief um, and having the right mindset will allow you to explode. Um, But just having the mindset alone, if you don't have the skill or the hard work, they're not going to be successful. I mean, we, we know a lot of guys that are, you know, call themselves entrepreneurs that have the right, the right mindset, but they're, they're really dumb as a box of rocks, right? You're not, we, we all know you're not. Uh, but, but there are guys that they don't hustle. They don't have the skill. They just have the, the, the mindset, which alone is, I think, worthless. I don't know if you guys disagree with me. There's some, there's some well, saying or, or something about the difference between dreaming um, and really planning, you know, and, and, uh, and dreaming of just, and I, I kind of think what Chris Mole is saying, I believe that as part of the mindset, uh, hard work comes with it. You know, I, I don't think you have this abundance growth oriented mindset. And then you sit on the couch and just kind of drink your beer and, and hang out and think, Oh man, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to, mm-hmm. I'm going to run a $10 million pay. I think that's dreaming. Yeah. I think yeah, that's that makes sense. Growth oriented so mindset. Yeah. To Chris's sense. point, our beliefs generally, uh, generate activity. There are, uh, our actions, right? So like our identity plays a lot into our belief system. And then part of that mindset is being open to challenge your own beliefs or at least evaluate them right and not have dogma and be unwilling to change um so i think first off it's like hey like i'm open to change i'm not going to change every time i'm influenced by something but i'm at least going to be open to it and then once i identify that a belief is limiting me then i'm going to adopt a new belief and get the hopefully get the result that i'm after by adopting that new belief and I think yeah. that's where the mindset, I think once you, once you have the right mindset, once you have the right belief system, then that's going to, like I said, that's just going to uh, produce a better activity. That's going to give you the result. Yeah. Nick, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think um, one of the things, you know, cause we, we trafficked heavily in the book called grit and it's very important to delineate the difference between um, the, the scientific version of grit and the grit, which we all know, which is just like muscle manning your way through everything. And I did the dumb, dumb version of grit for 24 years in this industry before I actually did something more intelligent. And the, the scientific definition of grit is having a superordinate goal and then, um, having enough, you know, um, tenacity to see it through over many, many decades. And the hard work part, which Brad was saying is comes in in a different way. It's not head down through the brick wall over and Mm -hmm. over, just physically exhaust yourself. It's intentional practice. So it is, it can be hard work, but a lot of the times it can be fun for us. It's you're, you're doing a, a certain thing over and over and over again with a feedback loop. And you're always putting a little stretch goal out in front of you. It's not just doing work mindlessly. It's doing work with somebody telling you good or bad constant improvement and stretching yourself. So that's, that's the, that's the, uh, when we talk about grit, it's probably a good, foundational thing to set that we're not talking about just belting the teeth get out there and conquer the world this is actually a very sophisticated mindful approach to hard work yeah i love it there's a a... yeah i I just think yeah i and i think nick makes such a good point it it is that passion and, and the perseverance over time and so that's where the talent and the effort so it's talent times uh effort equals skill skill times effort equals achievement right? So it's all playing in together. Yeah, there's a, a saying that, you know, some people, it depends how you perceive the saying, 
Um, I perceive it in a certain way that I think is not offensive, but there's a, there's an expression called labor loses. And I think that means stupid labor loses. So if you just, if it's just head down, you know, no matter what, what kind of business you're starting, whether it's marketing agency, like I did, or painting company, like you guys all did when you're, if you're just, I'm just going to outwork everybody. I think that's sort of the price of admission is you have to be willing to work hard or you shouldn't really be in the game of entrepreneurship and business ownership. But if your game plan, if your strategy is just, well, I'm just going to work harder than everybody, you, you probably are not going to ultimately find as much success as you could. It'll be a, an inefficient approach. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's stamina over um, intensity, right? Yeah. But there are times where intensity matters. There are times where you have to work your face off, but the goal is making it sustainable to yeah. be able to move at a sustainable pace and position yourself. I think it's a goal for all of us as owners um, because if not, we just, it's a heck of a lot uh, less risk just being an employee, right? But as an owner, we're working to doing um, the things that we love and the things that we're best at in our day, or at least that's my goal. My goal is like, I love sales and leadership. So I want my day to consist of sales and leadership, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if it takes me 60, 70 hours a week initially to get, so six, let's say 60 hours a week to where eventually I'm doing six hours of leadership, then I'm willing to do that, to sacrifice that 60 to eventually get to where I'm just working six. And it's at my own, it's of my own accord. It's of my choice. Yeah, I'm spending my time doing the things I love to do and doing the things I'm best at, right? And that's when you're, that's when you're generally out operating at your best. When you're operating um, in your natural um, skill and, um, and doing, yeah, doing what you're interested in, right? That's how it, you get, it's easy to get passionate about something that you love, right? Mm -hmm. We don't spend a whole lot of time in the things that we're not passionate about. Chris Talley, can you kind of expand on that? Because I want to make sure that that when we talk about this stuff, we drill down and give people who are listening really actionable takeaways. You know, like if they're if they're listening to you and and say they are they like sales and leadership, or, or maybe they like something that's different from what they're doing. Let's say they're still on the brush, or, or they're still um, doing a lot of the estimating, and they'd really like to really be more managing and, and leading and inspiring their people. And you say, well, if you have to work sixty hours. To, to get to where ultimately you're only doing six hours of, of something you don't want to be, or, you know, you have to work, you're doing six hours and you want to be doing 60 hours of it. And you have to, to put in a lot of work. What does that mean? Are you talking about building systems and processes? Are you talking about something else? What, what, how do you get there? Yeah, I think it's uh, creating a vision for the future, right? So being a vision casting. So one, identifying what you want, um, being able to not only see what that, that vision is for you and your company, then being able to articulate it in a way that your people can see what you're saying, right? Then being able to make it believable for the people that you're sharing this vision for, and then putting the tactical steps to, to do that. So if the goal is, hey, I'm, I'm currently in the bucket working the brush, but I want to just be doing sales. Okay, great. Now we have the goal. Now let's mm -hmm. make the tactical steps to achieve that. What's that look like, right? So I think it, it's really important to start with the end in mind. Um, to spend some time internally thinking about what you truly want. If you're just moving without a plan, like it's really easy to get off course. If you're, if, if I'm in Colorado and I want to get to Florida to see my buddy Brandon, but I don't use a map and I just start driving it. I may end up in Canada, right? Dude, you or just got to drive faster and, and more hours yeah. during the day. Stop right. sleeping. More, out and more recklessly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Rich, right? right. Yeah. Well, Brandon, I would say having the end, have the end goal in sight is probably super important for you and your clients because when we're when we're looking at our marketing spend and our strategy, it always starts with well, what is our what is our goal revenue? Sure. And once I know the goal revenue, then you, you work back. Okay, well, based on the the marketing activities that we're doing, how many leads need to be generated? How much do we need to spend to generate those leads? Of the leads that are generated, what percentage are going to turn into estimates and what percentage of estimates are going to turn into sales? What's our average uh, job size? And if you don't know all that data. Just having the end, you know, just having a, a, an idea of like, well, I want to double in size. Okay, well, how? What are you, what are your numbers? You got the end goal, but now start working backwards to step yeah. one, which is where you're going to spend your first dollar in marketing, right, Brandon? Yeah, no, I love it. And yeah, the, the I think when you figure out where you want to go, I think you need to figure out why you want to get there too. You know, it's kind of because sure. yeah. you are going to run into hiccups. You know, there are going to be issues, and you better you better know why, um, or you're going to give up potentially. But then, yeah, knowing your metrics, 
is important. Chris, yeah. more. Yeah, so, so are you saying that have a contingency plan in order? No, you got to burn the boats, man. I don't, I'm not really a big believer in the contingency plan, but I, I think you, you have to know why you're doing what you're doing, I think. And, you know, for me, personally, it's financial freedom and time with my family and the ability to do all kinds of stuff. That's a, that's a big driver for me that keeps me going during dark days. And whether it's, you know, whatever it is for you, um, it's like Simon Sinek, start with why. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. yeah yep. so chris mole you are in a a pretty interesting situation because you you are in a in an area that has a, an incredibly small population something that most people would use as an excuse to fail you know they, they would say well th th there's not enough there just isn't enough work here to to get to more than 200 000, 250 000 a year can you speak a little bit to your population and what you've done and maybe where you're at in, in terms of revenue and, and everything else with your business? Yeah, I can honestly say that I've that I owe it all to networking, to be honest. You know, mm -hmm. I've um the relationships that I've built while after I've made this company, you see, uh little personal story on why I actually um built made a painting company. Because when I came to the States and um, I, I came here traveling, you know, and I wanted to change the scenery with everything. I feel like um, a new group of friends. Um, I wanted a, a new um, career. So I left painting behind and I worked in a construction company and ended up getting in a bit of bother and went to jail for 170 days and when I came out I used to work a seasonal job well here in Minnesota you uh, five months of the year you can work outside seven months of the year you get laid off you know and <clears throat> I got lit I hubbed out most of the summer and then for the first ever time I was broke I had nothing there was no propane in the tank I had my family and new baby was eating noodles completely broke had nothing and uh i felt useless i felt the worst i'd i've ever felt in my whole life you know especially as a family man a new family man and uh it was like massive action for me i actually um I went on fit. So I, I always go back to painting no matter what, because it's, a, it's the only thing that I know and how to be able to put, uh, to put food on the table. And I think it was this, um, it was probably about, um, I think it was about four years ago now, after I got out, it was in November, I just started, I was up like, 20 hours a day getting four hours sleep on the internet adding all of the pages on on facebook and then mick slavic popped up and uh and i added him and and reached out to him and he ignored me and uh no he didn't really <laughs> yeah i think i had like a bobcat on my shoulder or something and he was like oh man this guy and, uh, and then i was in i lived in minnesota you know and and then it was uh just just working for my wife's uh, family and friends and making a Facebook page and, and just uploading and learning marketing as I go and, and, uh, and, and just Facebook marketing and just being really persistent. And I would just, just keep uploading pictures and just, I just thought, you know what, this, this will work. I'm going to make it work. And I just grinded through it. You know, I didn't sleep. I was reading books. I was, I was reaching out to people like Nick and, and, uh, yeah, and, and it just clicked, you know. I remember being on a, a, a group and, and being in that, and I, I was just a one-man show at the time, and I was like, man, I'm, I'm actually getting jobs here, you know. And people, I didn't think that it would work here with being such a small community. I didn't think that there would be many. Uh, I remember calling the painting company, a local painting company in the area, and asking if they had jobs, and they laughed at me and put the phone down. And I was like, all right, well, let's go. So I just put the pedal to the metal and just and just went at it, and four years later we're, we're um, 
Yeah, we're, we're running like a, a $600,000 painting company with six painters. And it's only up until last year that I started job costing and actually running a, 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 a business properly, you know? I, What's the population where you live? The 16,000 people, like in my, I mean, I live in a, a town of 1,200, but I have to drive 35 minutes to a population of 16,000 people. So you have yeah. a service serviceable area of 16,000 people. 64,000 would be uh, an hour drive from pretty far from, drive. from Bemidji, which is uh, uh, the, the 16,000 um, um, area population. And then an hour drive from Bemidji, where most of my um, employees live, is, is about 64,000 people in total. Yeah. So you've gone in four years with really a $64,000 um, market, total addressable market from very minimal, uh, I guess, zero revenue when you started to now 600,000 and six painters. And you primarily yes. did that through, through Facebook, through community networking. Um, yep. You're a volunteer firefighter. I, I think you've probably formed some connections that way. Do you have any advice, you know, for, for people who are listening or in a really small service area for, who, who are maybe, maybe they started a painting company. Maybe they're even just thinking about starting a painting company. What advice do you have for them? Is that, is that what you would tell them to do to stay on Facebook all night and, and post the pictures have you learned a more efficient way what are your thoughts yeah i would just tell them to care you know and never give up and care about your people and care about your clients it's one of them ones where i mean um i'll tell a quick story here that there was a a client that was you know you get that one client out of a every 200 that is nuts absolutely <laughs> like out of this planet sort of nuts and uh, it was like a small popcorn texture ceiling. I scraped it, I painted it, and there was a little blemish in it. And she would call me five, six times on a Saturday at midnight, crying down the phone, like that sort of nuts. Anyways, I hope she doesn't listen to this, by the way. Um, anyways, she... <laughs> I don't uh, think she'll be listening. So I, I, I went back there, gave her our money back, fixed the area, and... Um, fixed the area and I got a phone call three weeks later from a guy that lived up the road and says oh you can make Heather happy and I want you to work on our house and we landed a $29,000 job in this Ooh. job that I, that I had but for just uh, just biting the bullet and just just doing it just whatever you know I take the rough like this more smooth than there is rough and just getting it done you know I love that. There's, there's more smooth than there is rough. Yeah. So, um, I think, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, before, before we, we kind of move on to someone else, I definitely need to address the fact that, well, you said you were in jail for 170 days and you have a Dexter, you know, you got plastic sheet <laughs> behind you, you look like Dexter. I'm, I'm not sure if you change your ways or not. He's, but, he's heading back. If this, you know, we are recording this, so just, yeah. just make sure you're, you're thinking about that. All right, not gonna get me on evidence on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Should he scrub up? No, uh, to, to get back to the point, really though, I just think net, network with people that are smarter and that have been doing this for a, a, a lot longer than you. Um, mm -hmm. Read, listen to audiobooks. I'm not much of a reader. Listen to audiobooks. Go online, find a group that suits your culture of what you want find the people that you enjoy being around that you care about mostly you know that have got the same personality as you and that's doing it man that is that's killing it that's been doing it for a long time honestly and just uh yeah and and actually to, um help fill their cup as well as um drinking even though it's impossible for nick slavic you have to bribe him with turkey hunting and stuff but i think uh that, I think you've, you've got to help fill cups as well as drinking from other people's as well. You know, you have to give a little back to, to your community, to your friends, to your colleagues, to your loved ones. I think you've, it's, it's got to be a, a, a conscious be, um, give, 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 you know, yeah. it gets, uh, it, it drains you a little bit. You give and the universe will reciprocate. 
So Nick Slavic is is uh, courteous enough to be on this podcast, even though he is not feeling well, actually feeling quite poorly. Um, so this might be kind of brief. And Nick, if if you're gonna curl or anything, feel free to to leave at any time. But one of the things that you know, I, I think everyone thinks of Nick Slavic, and you you almost have this um, almost like a demigod image, right? Like like you you're you're the perfect ultimate artisan, you know, the ultimate craftsman um, of oh. painting and, and you've got it all figured out with, with the oh. decent human being model um, <laughs> and, and everything's perfect. But one of the things that you ran into, which I loved, or one of the things that you addressed at, at that Ask a Painter Live Winter Retreat was some of the things you're struggling with. And, and they would actually be, a lot of people wouldn't expect it because the thing that you really dove into was people, you know, and, and that's your forte. That's what everyone, you know, Nick Slavic, he's figured it out that the, the decent human being model, I'm, I'm going to follow him. So can you speak a little bit? To, I think just people seeing their, their role models and really honestly, for a lot of people, probably idols of, of sort here. Um, you're human. You struggle. You still have struggles with, you know, can you speak a little bit to that and, and kind of what you're doing to try to overcome, overcome it? Yeah, I tell you what, even since um, the uh, Ask a Painter Live Winter Retreat, where we, we go real deep and we get really personal, I've actually identified another limiting belief that I have, which is, I think my, my ego, I have a fixed mindset and I have a lot of ego wrapped up into the people in this business. So when somebody, when somebody leaves, it does wreck me for a while because I do take that personally. And you know, you can, at one point you can say, well, that what's make, that's what makes you good. You're caring, you're empathetic, you're this and that, but there's another way to look at it, which is you have a non-abundance mindset, a fixed mindset where the performance of your company is you and you live and die by the performance of your company. And so that, that is a new limiting belief that I've identified. And I need to find a way to uncouple myself from that because it does take a lot out of me when, when somebody decides not to do this with me. So that is a huge thing. And, you know, again, fine, we can recruit. We got the decent human being theory. We got a training facility. We got everything to do that. But <clears throat> I don't like taking steps backwards. I, every bit of effort I do, I like it to be building towards something else and, the thing I need to harness that limiting belief, do some work with it and get over it is because every time an employee comes and goes, um, it does sort of like feel like a huge setback and I need to uncouple myself from that. So I think the next year or so is probably going to be devoted to, you know, diving deep into that and trying to figure that out a little more. So, yeah, but so that's, we are, we are a humanistic business that happens to paint and, you know, there is, you have to, the pattern detection, which I believe we are all in the, uh, uh, in the business of pattern detection as well, is people bring all sorts of mass personal chaos with them wherever they go. And um, it's tough because there might be nothing you can do. You might overpay, over empathize, over benefit, give people more leeway than they want. And because of something out of your control in their own personal lives, that will dictate whether they come and go and how it affects your business. And that is a hard thing to get over with because we are the rainmakers, right? If something needs to be done, we can affect the change. And when we, when there's no way for us to possibly affect change, that's helplessness. And as entrepreneurs, we do not dwell in helplessness. Yeah. I love that. So you, so you I mean, this, that's a totally different I mean, in a way, it's a totally different subject matter than really anything I've explored on the podcast, which is this idea, I personally struggle with it, that you wrap, you, you give so much of something to your business that it sort of becomes you. And if, and for you, the, the people is, is kind of what, you know, it's your thing. It's what you really, truly care about tremendously. And it's where you've built a lot of your success. But if the business fails or something, like you said, out of your control, because personal lives, you know, people have lives and, and you can't fix every problem. You're not God. Um, they have a problem. Then you take it as essentially a personal failure. You're like, you're failing in your life. That's how you take it. And, and how, and you're basically going to spend the next year of your life. It, it, one of the things you're going to work on is how do you, how do you sort of de decouple yourself without reducing your performance, I guess? Yeah, that's it. And uh, so everybody in this group, knows me well enough to know that I take long, deep dives into books and traction has been a six year thing for me. The book grit has been a two, two and a half year thing for me. And the next book for me is mindset. Uh, it's actually done over 40 years 
by a clinical psychologist and they dwell in the fixed versus abundance mindset. And when I got done reading that book, it really clicked for me. It's like, I used to think that this was a badge of honor. Like I am, I am the empathetic, caring boss and I'm, I'm carrying this weight, this, this huge emotional baggage because that's what makes me special. And that's my thing that I can give to these people in the world. And it's actually a weakness. And, and uh, if you if you believe the fixed versus abundance mindset, it's actually uh, a really bad way to go through life. With an abundance mindset, you would think, you know what, there's always going to be other people out there. Maybe you could have done a little better for them, but it's completely out of your control. And there'll be more opportunities later. And I believe that, but it has to feel right too. And it can't biologically mm -hmm. affect you. So that's, that's my next interest. <laughs> Chris Elliott, what are you, you're, you're extremely passionate about leadership. That was a big thing that you dove into and even thinking about yeah. changing your employee model because you thought you could make more impact. What's your thought on all this? Yeah. So I think that one, I, I don't think we can attach, um, our businesses can't be us, right? Not at least not if you're going to scale, right? So uh, a lot of what we're passionate about and our vision for the business is obviously uh, in the business, but we cannot be the business. So I think that part of the growth and maturity over time is creating that separation. Like, so for on it painting, it needs to be its own living, breathing organism, right? Now I'm tasked with nurturing that and helping it grow in a very healthy way, but it is not me. Right. So I think that's really important, um, to, um, uh, change your perspective with the business as it is its own thing. It's not a part of me, right? Um, and then uh, the, it is very challenging when, when you bring someone in, uh, you invest into them, you share your knowledge, your expertise, um, you share your company, something that you've put so much time and effort into, uh, not only the culture, but the systems, the processes, uh, the, and, and extraordinary uh, experience and service that you provide your, your customers. And they get to come in there and be a part of that. And um, it hurts when they leave. But then I think over time, you learn um, that, well, one, it's just expectation, right? Not everybody that comes into the company is going to stay. Um, a lot of times it is just a stop for them. Uh, but we hope it's a stay. And we want to invest into them as it's a stay. Um, and, um, but I think if you have the right expectation, right, for yourself and them, that it doesn't hurt as much when they, when they leave. Yeah. And I know, Nick, one of the things that you had, I guess, been struggling with a little bit is when people leave, or, or I think you, you overheard an, an employee um, say that, that for now, this was the best opportunity. And, and for you, that, that hurt, you know? And I, I think called him out on that, if you remember. Did you? I remember Brad, <laughs> yeah, Brad, right. when, uh, Brad went to bat. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, Chris, uh, Elliot, that's kind of, what you're saying right now, I mean, I, I don't think, I don't think it's reasonable. I, I mean, I understand why it happens, but th these are our babies, you know, it's our business. Mm -hmm. We're growing, we're, we welcome people in, you know, in, it basically to, to become a part of this growth journey with us, but maybe it, it is just a step on their growth journey. Maybe this isn't sure. their, their vision or their dream, no matter how much we want it to be. Sure. Yeah. And I think there should be a level of attrition, right? If people aren't leaving, you're probably not pushing hard enough right? In general for the company, not them, but uh, there should be, uh, you're not always going to get it right, right? So we're, something we've really tried to, to get better at is that recruiting process, because it's not great for us or the individual if we bring them in the company and they're not the right person or they're not in the right seat. So if they're not in the right seat, we obviously can look for opportunities to get them in the right seat. Um, so we're not immediately giving up on them, but if they're not the right person, we made a mistake. We did them and ourselves a disservice. So part of it is that, that like being able to understand what that prospect pool is for you, who you're, who you're recruiting for, for what position, um, having a good system of bringing onboarding, uh, having a good system for training. Um, and then, um, uh, did I lose you guys? I see. No, I, we're here. Okay. We're still Sorry. Okay. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just hiring the right person, hiring the right person. So then, you're not bringing, you're not hiring bad employees. I have to say that's probably been one of the most painful um, parts of my journey in my business is bad hires. It hurts. It, almost nothing hurts more than a bad hire. So I think that um, 
yeah, I think just a, a, a really great, a, a very intentional focus on getting the right people on the right seat can save both you and the uh, candidates or the people you bring into your team uh, a lot of pain. But I don't, I think it's an unrealistic expectation uh, to think that everybody's going to stay. Do you have any, anything that you've learned for how to avoid bad hires that, that you could share? Yeah, I think that part of it, I think part of it, again, is as you mature as a business and as you mature as a business owner uh, or business leader, you, uh, you start to understand uh, yourself better. You start to understand your business better. So you just, you, you understand uh, who the right people is. So the, again, as you're able to articulate that vision and the mission of your company a little better, as you start to um, identify and articulate the values of your company, it gets a lot easier to align the right people with your company um, and, and it, whether they possess the, the right cultural virtues um, uh, for someone that would be within your organization. So for us, it's um, humble, hungry, and smart, right? So are, are they humble? Um, are they interested in the collective goal uh, of, the, of the organization? Um, are they hungry? Do, are, they, are they wanting to work, right? Do they, do, they, do they want to be there? Do they have the capacity to do the job? Do they get the job? Um, and um, are they just generally self-motivated and hardworking, right? And then smart is, are, are they people smart? Do they get the dynamics? Or the, do they understand group dynamics and know um, not only how to interact with other team members, but also how to interact with your, your customers, right? So for us, those are the three virtues that someone has to possess. We didn't, we're, we're seven years in. It took a lot, a lot of trial and error to get to the point that we understand that to be on our team, you have to be humble, hungry, and smart. We didn't know that six years ago, right? So some of this is just experience and exposure and then paying attention and being able to document your data um, and um, and learn from, just learn from your experience, right? Pay attention. Yeah. Would you say that that those values, especially for companies that are maybe a bit smaller than you, do those values start with the owner, with the founder? If you're, if you're a small company, should you look at yourself and say, this is who I am, this is what I value, and therefore I'm, this is what the company, or is that not the way you would think about it? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think initially... I think, again, I think the company grows and becomes um, something of itself, uh, but initially a lot of our company is a, is a lot of um, the things that we care about and how we express it through our, through our business. Yeah, I love that. So yeah, I think it's, I mean, that's intentional hiring, you know, the, the, where, where you're actually putting pen to paper and you're, you're sitting and taking the time. I think very few companies do that We're actually write the value system and i think when they do it uh, you know you, you'll get these big corporations that do it that i think is largely an hr exercise but I, th I think people think it's trivial or or soft or you know it doesn't really actually matter uh and you're sitting here saying that it's it's everything for bringing the everything. right people on board and ultimately i think every business but especially a service-based business like painting we are you know we're running people a people company here I think uh, it's such a huge part of, of building a great culture, but then once that culture is established, it gets really easy to identify who's not a part, or who, who's not a part of that team or shouldn't be a part of that team. Um, but for me, it did start with my values. Like I, uh, I changed them a few times. Like I, I think our first core values, I copied off someone else's website. <laughs> so, uh, and then, start. right, right. And then, start. then I, then I recognized, um, that, that, that it mattered and it mattered to me, right? I wanted to lead, I wanted to be able to cast a vision for my team that people could get behind, right? Um, and then I wanted to be able to make sure the people that I was in a, to work towards that goal are people that align with, with the things that I care about, align with my, my values, and align with my belief system. So, so our, our values for our company um, are focus on the customer, deliver on your promises, take ownership in everything, pursue growth and happiness, right? That started with my values, my number one value, focus on others and then deliver on your promises, take ownership in everything and pursue growth and happiness because it, it, it goes back to grit. Again, that, that passion and that persistence to pursue that, that long-term goal, happiness is very fleeting. So the goal can't necessarily just be happiness because it it's gonna come and go. The goal has to be fulfillment, right? The growth, and for me, that, that fulfillment comes through 
to pursue a, a growth mindset, having a growth mindset and pursuing growth and being, there's moments that I'm the teacher, but, but there's also moments that I'm the learner and I have to be able to play both of those roles. And, and for me, that's where I find my fulfillment. So uh, Chris Elliott, you are a very busy guy. You run a very successful company and, and um, you're working on constantly improving that. But you basically, I think when people listen to stuff like this, a lot of what, a lot of what ends up happening is they don't really know where to start or they don't feel qualified or they don't, they don't feel they know themselves well enough or their business well enough. So they end up not doing anything. And I, what you did where you basically just borrowed another company's values as a starting point and then kind of went from there, I think is genius. You have this, this starting point of humble, hungry, and smart. If, if anyone listening says, you know, I don't have values, but I like those. Those sound good. Um, you know, Chris, Ella, you were a ranger uh, in the U.S. Army, did, did four tours of duty. I mean, you're a pretty respectable guy. You've, you've started and grown a really successful business. If people hear this and they think, man, that would probably be a pretty good place to start. Can they reach out to you if, if they have a couple questions or they, or they want to, what would be the best way for them to, to potentially touch base with you? Yeah. So we, we, we talked about this at the beginning of the podcast, but yeah, it's, it's uh, a giver's gain mentality, right? So it is a give and take. So I'm, I'm more than happy to, to give and, and anyone can reach out to me uh, um, through my email, C Elliot on a painting.com. Uh, Instagram is uh, Chris Elliot or uh, at Chris Elliot on it. Um, and um, yeah, I'm happy to help in any way. Cool. Brad, you have been remarkably quiet and, and you haven't gotten in the ring with anyone yet, which makes me think that these guys aren't saying, I know, I think Nick is sick, which is probably part of the problem here, but these guys aren't saying anything, um, I guess, too, too, uh, what, what is the word I'm looking for? Here? Brandon, I think the wine might've subdued him that you all sent us. Did it, did it subdue him? Brad, you've been going, yeah, you had a little too much. He didn't maybe. challenge I'm me sorry. once, so I, there's no way his microphone's working. <laughs> I'm going to sleep, I'm going to sleep for the past 30 minutes. What are you guys? <laughs> No, the, you know, what's funny is, um, I am, I am a, uh, I don't, I like to argue. Um, but really when I'm around guys like you, I, I like to challenge and it's certainly not, it's totally out of respect, but also you guys are freaking smart. You're successful. <laughs> what you're doing, uh, is working. Um, yeah, yeah, I haven't heard anything yet to disagree with. So, um, kudos guys, you're either speaking my language now or, <laughs> Or, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe drunk. I'm toned down. I'm, or I'm Brad, drunk. It, Brad, it, it was the wine. <laughs> Brad, let's say, let's say that, you know, let's say someone's running the company and, and maybe it's not going the way that they want it. Or, and, and I'm not saying they're going to start over, but I think there's a lot of value in thinking if you were to just start, start over, um, hypothetically, uh, on a company, what, what would you focus on? Right. Like, like how would you build it from the ground up? You know, um, Chris Moles talked about four years. It took him four years to get there. And he just, he grinded, pumped, he gave back, gave, gave, gave. Um, Chris Elliott's talked about this idea of giving. He's talked about the values and really finding the right hire. Uh, Nick's talked a, tr a tremendous amount about mindset, how he started with, um, you know, scarcity mindset. Every competitor was, you know, not to be collaborated with, not to be trusted. Now he's grown and still growing. What would your sort of number one priority be um, kind of growing a business? Well, so Chris Elliott just talked a lot about hiring. And um, one of the things I, I, I didn't hear him say, but I, I'm sure that he, he does this, is hiring before he needs it, right? Um, if you wait until you need Always someone. Always hiring. Now, yes. Always now you're hiring. If you, if you wait until you need someone for a position, you're already too late. And then you're scrambling and that's when you end up making a bad hire, which I've also done in the past. Um, so if, if I were to hypothetically start a new company within the next week or so even, um, the first thing that I would do is hire two people right off the bat. Um, hopefully I would have enough in my savings to bring on someone that can serve as a um, kind of a, a project manager type role. Uh, and then another person that would serve as an admin to help me with the scheduling and whatnot. Um, I, I love sales, so I would probably stick in, in that. Um, and I love recruiting. So I would, you know, work on trying to find some, some painters. Um, but that's the thing. I, I, if, if I were to start a company, I, I don't have any sales yet. I would need to hire all, right away. 
Um, I, well, I wouldn't, I guess, I guess most people start out just themselves painting, but I, since I'm not a painter, uh, I would actually hire and invest that before I actually make my first sale or um, um, complete my first job. So uh, that would be one thing. Um, the other thing I would do is have a very strategic marketing plan and spend a shit ton of money to start generating leads. I, I know that I can sell by myself $2 million a year in painting services. Um, but I can't do that if I don't have anyone to sell to. And if I were to start a company now, no one knows who Ellison Paint would, you know, hypothetically, it was called Ellison Painting, uh, who that is. Um, and so I would have to rely on someone like, you know, Brandon to help me come up with that strategy and, and implement it. Um, what's been really nice for me is, is talking to uh, like, like Jason Paris and Nick and Brandon, guys that are, I think, expert marketers and kind of figured that out. Uh, I think there's ways to generate a lot of sales leads very, very quickly. Um, and if you have a, uh, an efficient sales system, sales cycle, and a, a good salesperson, you could close a lot of deals right away. Um, but again, the, the thing that comes after that, the third thing I would do is recruit the hell out of the Metro Detroit area. Um, we, because I'm not a painter, I would have to uh, hire painters and I would probably do it in a fully subcontracted model. So uh, I would have to find subcontractors and that's, I, I'm always looking for better ideas to find them. Um, we have a really nice Sherwin-Williams rep that refers uh, crews over to us. Um, but it might be hanging out at Sherwin Williams stores and try seeing who's coming in and and finding guys that are are looking for work. Uh, a lot of us are part of that painting contractors group on Facebook, and I'm an administrator on that now. Uh, so I'm I'm one of three admins. There's 112 uh, 112 thousand members in that Facebook group. I think I have a little bit of clout if I said I was looking for subcontractors in the Metro Detroit area that I could probably find someone. Um, but I'm confident that if I decided to start a company today, that I could I could get it up and running and rocking and rolling in 2022 uh, pretty quickly. But if so, so I'll be I'll be totally frank with you. If if you had asked me that, this question a year ago, Brandon, before I had met uh, Chris and Chris and Nick and Jason and all and all the guys at the retreat, I don't know because you guys know my background. My background is I, I started working for a painting company that was long established since 1984 and uh, ended up partnering with the, with the founder. And that's what I've been doing for the past five years. Um, I, you know, I have a different background. So, and I, my, my scope was so narrow. I thought that Somerset painting was the biggest company in the world. And I thought that the way we did it was the absolute best way to do it. And I thought that two and a half, maybe $3 million was the, the ceiling for a, a painting company. And talk about destroying my limiting beliefs, spending four days with you guys up in Northern Minnesota and seeing guys that are killing it, doing what we do, but way better and way more quickly. Uh, it doesn't matter that I'm not a painter. Chris Elliott wasn't, isn't a painter. Uh, Jason Paris was barely a painter, right? <laughs> Matt Kuyper is not a painter. Uh, and you, and you guys run the, I think the three biggest, highest grossing, uh, uh, companies that were represented at that retreat. Um, and I, and I will touch on my one other limiting belief is competition is bad, right? Having other companies in your market uh, is bad. That's a, that's a belief that I inherited from the guy I work with. And being at the retreat and meeting um, specifically Nick Slavic and Jason Paris and seeing the relationship, uh, you know, the chairman and vice chairman of the PCA and traveling the country together, uh, friends, um, I think Nick actually pays one of Jason's companies to do some marketing for him, right? <laughs> talk, <laughs> talk about working together. It's, it's incredible that the two of them together in the same market just continue to raise the bar and both of them are uh, continue to be more and more successful. Um, it's crazy. I, I, I embrace competition now. Yeah. Yeah. It's that, that abundance, you know, the scarcity versus abundance mindset is so important. And <clears throat> so many people don't even understand that. Nick, I do want to point out since you decided that that you're going to just keep calling me the dirty marketer that brad just said you are, you are an expert marketer so now we're both dirty marketers uh easy now i am a painter that found out a tricky <laughs> way to market and also you know you remember lovingly when you when you inquired about the retreat i said we don't i mean listen 
consultants and marketers, we are very leery of you people. All right. Yep. And to let you come with on a retreat, which was a lot. We had a lot of group meetings. We had a lot of debates. We had a lot of everything else. And I said, I'm going to call you a dirty marketer in all love for that period. Okay. Then you yep. proved yourself. And now you're calling yourself a dirty marketer. That's Are a, you not like, calling me that anymore? Now. Are we past it? We no listen, we're past it. Doesn't look oh. like you are, but oh I'm done. <laughs> oh, I, I thought that this was my thing with you. No, I'm done. No, I do pass the hurdle. You pass muster, man. You're you're one dude, of us. So. <laughs> I love it. All right. The the term is put to bed officially. Dude, listen, Brandon, but you know what I'm talking about. I am so leery about getting cornered at the retreat when we're all having a good time, when we're all just telling about kids and dogs and fishing and hunting stories. My worst nightmare is somebody to grab you by the shoulder and be like, Hey man, you know, I do this service that I, I could do for you too. You know, it's one of those things. Like, it's like, no, man, listen, if we trust you, we'll find you. Don't worry. Yeah. And you didn't do that. A hard and, sale. There we go. Yes. There was yeah. no asking for the sale at the Ask a Painter live retreat. We were big fans. Yeah. Of that. <laughs> yeah. So funny. Yeah. Matt, Matt said something, Matt Kuyper, uh, call it, call his wife Cooper, um, on my podcast, but Matt Kuyper said, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate how you, how you handled or, or how you didn't, uh, basically how I handled the retreat. I, I it kind of shocked me, honestly. I mean, I, I took it as a compliment I mean, he didn't even know me coming into it, but I guess it, it, it surprised me that you guys would expect something different, but I can see how some people would be different. I mean, it just seems like you'd have to be a pretty big douche to, you, oh, you know, you know, you know how many friend requests I get on Facebook from, <laughs> yeah. from guys that are own marketing company. Hey, just trying to see what you're doing over at Somerset painting. Uh, uh, do you need help with the website? I'm like, bro, go to somersetpainting.com. We got a website, man. Yeah, <laughs> doing fine. I, good. Thank you. I make million dollar kings become two million dollar kings. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Um, so I want to, I want to touch. Brandon, on, I, I, yeah. Can I ask you a question? Why, why? So, uh, oh boy, yeah, yeah. So, what is the number one you think uh, that you think? Uh, contractors in our industry from a marketing perspective could improve on probably a long-term focus so i think i think and and uh nick loves this but i think that that with power partnering with a company that builds you the brand equity online so people are actually finding your site and becoming paying customers um is the the number one way to to build a long-lasting business over time it's also the number one way to get host and that's where where people are so leery of it because no one, and ultimately what I'm talking about is SEO and no one really, a lot of people don't really know what it means. It's nice to throw the, throw the buzzword around. Yeah. How's your SEO? I ran through your website, did free SEO audit, this or that. Um, but it's kind of a black box. And so when you, when you partner with a company, uh, a lot of people get taken advantage of and, oh, you just need to pay for another year. You just need to wait another year. You just need to keep waiting and, and it ends up you pay for three years. Nothing ended up happening. Um, because the marketer wasn't really doing anything and they were patting their pockets and you didn't, you didn't know anything. So you, you banned it off for life, but, and that's sort of the unfortunate, unfortunate reality of the situation, but that is the best long-term approach. I think this idea of pay for, pay for leads, the, the biggest issue um, is they wait to market till they need the, till, till they need the, well, lead. that, that's that follows along the, the same problem as like hiring before you need it. You need to, you, you know, need to invest in your marketing before you need it. And so I think a lot of painters, are looking for the, the quick hit. How do I get leads right now? Yeah, and I need it yeah this that's month. important. I mean, but but yeah, but you're in a pinch, right? You need it's sales January. Now. I need it. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. I want to I want to clarify but, what I said earlier. I said always be always be hiring. Uh, what I really meant is always be having hiring activities. Like always be doing hiring activities. Yeah. So, so then you're funnel not funnel in. Hiring. Yeah. Then you're not in the position to make a desperate hire because you you've continued uh, prospecting new candidates, interviewing. Um, even from a, 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 a labor force that like we, so in the, for the past year, we've had someone dedicated to, uh, just scheduling and recruiting. So obviously the seasonality of our business, um, during the second and third quarter, 80% of his time is dedicated to scheduling just simply because it's super dynamic during that time of year. But during the, uh, winter months, 80% of his time is dedicated to recruiting. Mm. Yeah. So is he, re so is he, he recruiting subcontractor crews? Is he recruiting? That's correct. Yeah. So we, he, I, so his, what does he do? His met, so everyone in our company has a number. His number is five interviews a week. So he recruits, he, he interviews at least one crew every single day uh, during off peak. Ooh, how does he, how does he find them? Uh, so as you said, so, so work in the stores. Uh, so getting to the store, getting, getting uh, 
uh, flyers out, um, Facebook job ads, uh, Craigslist ads, Indeed ads. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, we give him a budget. So he's actually, we, we're actually paying for, we have ad spend just for recruiting. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So Which by the way, you, Chris, Chris Elliott mentioned earlier that he you know, kind of stole ideas from people when he started out. Um, I don't think there's anyone better in this whole world than me at just stealing other people's ideas. <laughs> I'll, be the, I'll be the first to say, like, yeah. I, am not, I am not creative. Uh, people think I'm creative because I, I used to, like, sing and act and stuff. Uh, I'm not creative. I'm just, like, a guy who can sing. I am – what I am is uh, I'm a mimicker. And so when I, when I see a guy like Chris Elliott and he's, he's so successful doing what I want to be doing – why would I try to reinvent the wheel? Why don't I just find out what Chris is doing? Yeah. Uh, see if he, um, see if he's willing to help yeah. me get, get it off the ground. And then along the way, maybe you, you make some tweets to tweaks to, to make it like more your thing, meet more your personality or the, the vibe of your company. But why would I try to invent a whole new system from scratch when there's guys that already figured it out? Sure. Right? There's no shame in that. I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. Yeah, yeah. That was a, that was a big one for me to overcome. It was, it was my ego. Honestly, so I, I at the retreat, I mentioned this is I, I read traction the first year of my business. Seven years ago, I read traction and I was like, I took a couple of things from it. Then it sat on the shelf until uh, two and a half years ago, reread it, read it again, read it again, and, and, and been implementing for the last two and a half years. And it has, I won't say that it's changed my business. But it's it, it's definitely uh, enhanced my business, and so a big, but a big part of was just getting over thinking I was smarter than this book that had this great operating system. I was like, well, I don't need that. I'm going to make my own, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with cultural virtues, like defining humble, hungry, and smart. Like that's not mine. I thought it had to be mine for a long time, but that that I adopted that out of a book I read, and I was like, yeah, I, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. Now again, I'll put my own uh, flavor on it. Um, but I don't, I don't need to create it. Like for you, you, the hungry for you just means like you actually have to eat food. It has nothing to do with like drive or motivation. I'm just actually yeah, kind of hungry. Yeah, no, for me yeah. personally, like, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> I'm actually a little hungry right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Brandon, I wanted to get back. So I asked that question because I have to believe a big, a big uh, part of what's holding a lot of contractors back in regards to marketing is limiting beliefs mm -hmm. am i wrong no i think you're i think you're 100 right i think it's limiting beliefs and and i think it's i think it's a bad experience in the past you know most people mm -hmm. have had that and then i think it's it's not really having clarity on the future vision you know the, the companies mm -hmm. that we partner with that make sense when i ask them questions and, and as brad brought up you know our sales process is really focused on the future first you know we're, we're what do you want why do you want it what does that mean um mm -hmm. How do you balance that though? Because because obviously there, it's it's going to be a big step for someone to say, okay, I, I I'm buying what you're selling. I'm going to invest into the long term. I'm going to be patient and I'm going to go with, with this uh, search engine optimization approach, right? But I also need leads today. So how do you balance mm -hmm. that? Yeah, so that one, what we'll do typically. So we offer both. But mm -hmm. typically, if someone needs leads today, they're not going to be able to afford both. That's just the reality. So what we'll do in that mm -hmm. situation is we'll do the paid ads. We'll do paid leads. Um, and we do exclusive leads. We don't sell leads or anything to multiple companies. Mm -hmm. But we'll do that for probably a period of four to six months. Basically, put some meat on their bones, so to speak, in terms of their business to where then they can start actually making the monthly investment. It's all about budgeting, you know, on top sure. of the paid ads. But if you, if you need leads today, you need leads today. And you can't be investing yeah. into something with, with promises of a year from now because the reality is, as idyllic and nice as that sounds, you're going to go bankrupt. And, and you, right. you know, what I always tell, and I've told many, many people on this because I'm still conducting most of the sales, actually all the sales at this point for paying marketing pros. And people sometimes come through and say, listen, we're not a fit because I, I've been in a position where uh, I couldn't sleep at night financially, you know, wondering, wondering how things are going to go for my family and, and what I need to do. And, and I don't ever want to be in any way responsible for putting someone else in that position. So there are some people come through, it's just, you know, at that point, it, it's, you kind of just have to grind. I mean, Jason Paris did eight hours of door knocking uh, every Saturday for, I don't know how many years, and he's introverted. You know, I asked some of these people, okay, what, what are you doing? Do you go on and knock doors? I mean, it's the grit, the, the toughness, the perseverance, there are ways to get 
business without hiring me. You can go out and you can, you know, I mean, I'm just going to say it, you know, not to be misogynistic, but you can man up and you can go get business. Everybody can go get business. I don't care how introverted you are or, or whatever. Jason Parrish is super introverted. He strikes me as a little bit odd, a little bit socially awkward, but yet he knocked on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of doors. And so if he can do that, you can do it. And so if you're in a position where you're listening to this and, and you can't afford to spend all kinds of money on marketing, you don't trust marketers, then go get your own business. Do what Chris Mold did, you know, put, do network, go give back, you know, be in the community, go make friends, go to your chamber of commerce uh, meetings, go to, go to BNI meetings, get out there and put in some sweat equity. You're always going to pay with money or time, right? You, there's sweat equity and there's money. So how are you going to pay? But you, you have to pay somehow. Yeah. yeah, that's my rant. So, that's my rant for the night. Oh no, should be I, done. I love should it. be good. I love it. Beautiful. Yeah. Should be good. You didn't know. You Beautiful. didn't know, but you're getting interviewed today. So yeah, I yeah. So good. I, so the number one uh, driver for human decision making is loss, right? You think fear, it's gain, but fear. it's actually a two. Yeah, it's a two to one yeah. ratio loss, or you know, roughly a two to one loss to gain, right? So if it's time or money what is the loss that typically someone is not wanting to give up right yeah, people, people will not want to lose the money typically but then they're they're too lazy or they find reasons to not put in the time and so then they stay in kind of this cycle um then they they hire some crapshoot marketer who promised them to become a king you know through a facebook message and then they get burned because the guy is total fraud and then they they just curse marketers and then they keep doing their thing and staying at two hundred thousand uh, dollars for for the foreseeable future mm -hmm. Yeah. Chris, Elliot, one of the things that, that you brought up on the retreat, and I'm curious if whether or not you've implemented this, because we had talked about a cheap experiment, but you brought up, you're very passionate about leadership to the point you're, you're even considering um, making that almost a separate company, I believe, or, or you really want to implement that at least in your own business at the very minimum. And, and you have independent contractors and your big thing was, well, could I make more of an impact on people's lives if I went to W2? And so you were going to hire two W-2 painters. Have you done that? Are you still thinking about the same way? What's your thought? Yeah, we have not made the hires. We started the recruiting process. Nice. So, so part of Mel what, so Melvin's not only uh, recruiting, interviewing um, contractors. Um, and, you know, it's our goal to have a network of contractors. Again, we, we not only want to deliver uh, the highest standard of quality, to our customers, we want to we, we want to deliver uh, an extraordinary customer experience, right? And and all that, like we have to be able, especially on some of our larger, more complex commercial jobs, we have to be able to partner with great contractors to be able to deliver to to reduce the impact to the property, to do reduce the impact impact to the employees and the and the residents or, or tenants of that property. And part of that is partnering with great contracts, car, partnering partner with Ethos contractors partner with great car, uh, carpenters and, and great great painting crews, being able to have the flexibility of scale from uh, this, this, this project's a great fit for two to four painters and this one needs 40, right? So for our, our goal over the last 12 months is to uh, create a, a truly a network of contractors so that we could literally um, construct the perfect team for, for the customer and the project, right? Um, so that's what Mel has been working on. In addition to that, we are going to hire two painters that are the absolutely right people for our business and the absolute right seat. The benefit we have, we don't need to make that hire today, right? We're going to make the hire when we when they're able to be the right people and they're able to be in the right seat for the company. Um, so we're going to have a lot of patience um, in that, uh, but it will. I made a commitment and I deliver on my promises, so it will happen this year. I love it. Love it. Rock and roll. Hey, can I uh, can I just touch on because not only did we we meet originally, well, a few of us yeah at the at the um, Ask a Painter retreat, but we also met again at the at the PCA. And mm -hmm. uh, to plug that, I mean, what was the guy that opened it when he says? Um, a time as a currency that we never get back speech. What was his name again? Brandon Vaughn. Yeah. So that really hit home with me, you know? And I asked myself then, like, I'm here doing this away from my kids right now. Why? You know? And 
there's a reason why we often strive to share these experiences with others. It's the same reason why we put so much emphasis on community. You know, I, I feel like life is more rich with connections, specifically a connection that's cultivated with shared experiences like ourselves, you know, I, 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 and, and touching on like what I was saying before about networking with people mm. and finding the people that you, um, mm. that you just jive with, that you click with, that you, that you get on with. I mean, I, I learned so much from Shane Garrett, from, from Brad, man, when we, we sat down in that kitchen, you know, them after our talks and when we talked about family, like implemented so much of that, you know, like, um, it's a, it, it, I would love to hear everyone's perspective on, um, on the time thing as well, you know, like, uh, cause I think that's really important. I know we all talk about business and marketing and, and, um, and growing a company and leadership and stuff, but really like that we can always replicate or we can always hire somebody. We can always get another job. We can always make more money. Right. But time is, really the only currency that we're working with that we don't get back we can't mm -hmm. gain it back so it's it's something that's really burned into me right now and i've been so much more intentional with it like by doing the um the the weekly family meetings with my family you know like mm -hmm. what jason paris um implemented and has shared and i really want that to go viral because I think it's important, you know, we've had so many people, look at, we, we were just talking about it um, earlier, this, it doesn't matter how successful you are, you can, your family can still be broken because you're not mm -hmm. there. You can still be there in the house, but mm -hmm. you're not there, um, you're not there in person, you know what I mean? You don't put down the electronics mm -hmm. and actually look at your family and look yeah. at your kids in the eyes and be there in person with your wife, with your kids, you know, so that's I, that's something that I know I've I've spoken at great length about with you guys. Um, my three my three things that I'm passionate about is my it's my faith, my family, and fitness. And anything I do, you notice I didn't mention my business or my mm -hmm. my career, my professional yep. life at all. Um, that though that's that's secondary to those three things. And because we have a limited amount of time, any time I'm going to spend is only going to be spent furthering one of those three things and so yeah i spend a lot of time at the gym and, and it makes my body uh healthy and strong and it creates a um a good example for my kids keeps me um at least decently attractive and not <laughs> to my wife right You're super hot Brad. Don't, you could just <laughs> yeah. say it. it's okay yeah. Yeah. uh but Brad, you know, Brad when I was young, what, so hot right now <laughs> <laughs> when i when i was younger i'd spend a lot of time uh you know playing video games and doing a bunch of stupid things that it, at this point in my life doesn't benefit my faith my family or my my fitness and so i i've chosen to get rid of those things and that understand though that that, that doesn't mean like i don't hang out with my friends because hanging out with my friends guess what that does i have strong strong males as my friends and that helps my relationship with my wife because i need that Everyone needs that. We are the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. And mm -hmm. so like outside of our spouse. And so I spend time with guys that are strong Christian men. Most of them are business owners. Uh, they're all great dads. They're all healthy. Um, uh, and they're, they're terrific husbands. And I hope that I'm the average of the five guys I spend, spend time with. And actually what I found is I have that group here at home. But man, it was crazy. We spent four days together up in Minnesota at Nick's retreat. And I found another group of people just like that. Right. And I, and I consider you guys, my people now. And me, if, if I'm the, if I'm the average of the people that were at the retreat, man, I'm doing pretty darn good. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, this yeah I, I do want to say one thing um what i believe brad had had kind of talked about but this idea of of i think brad brought up stealing ideas but networking mentorship i think it's incredibly undervalued as a society 
Um, and I think painting business owners are no exception to that. I, uh, the PCA, uh, Painting Contractors Association, is absolutely an incredible organization. Most of mm -hmm. our listeners are already subscribed to Overdrive, but, but a fair amount of them are not actually members of the PCA. And then we have a lot of listeners that are not uh, members of the PCA. Become a member. If you're serious about your business, and I don't work for the PCA, I don't get paid by the PCA. If you're serious about your business, become a member. There's, why wouldn't you? It's essentially free. And you learn so much from people who have come before you. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Even if you think you're, you're that smart, at least use it as a starting point. You know, like Chris Elliott talked about, use the values as a starting point, steal them or use traction. If, if you're so smart that you're going to create a better operating system, then use it as a starting point and then show why, how you're so smart. But don't stay stagnant. Don't stay with inaction because you're just too smart to implement this stuff. And, and so you're just going to figure it out on your own. That is a stupid inefficient way to operate and you will never reach the level of success you could or you should if you operate that way but i do want to wrap it up we've been going for a really long time do any of you guys uh have any any parting comments any advice that you want to give any of our listeners you have to um follow along and like the ask a paint a live show as well yep. if you really want to dig deep not only in the coding science and and entrepreneurship but um to meet some of the best minds and the best people not just the best minds but the best people in the industry mm. yeah brad um yeah i would just say reach out to people that you look up to uh within the industry that's been incredibly valuable to me my my world has completely changed over the past year since i started um reaching out on facebook to guys that were doing things better than me um and uh, yeah, I, I would say humble, be, be humble. Um, a lot of, I think a lot of people, men especially, get locked into this mindset of their, you know, they, they've tried everything. I've, no, no one, I've already figured it out. I don't need any help. Uh, but if you let down that guard and let someone else uh, kind of take a snapshot of where you're at, they could identify some of the, your limiting beliefs for you <laughs> and, uh, and even provide your roadmap to um, to, to place you didn't even know you could go. Chris Elliott. Yeah. So there is a, there's a quote in, in uh, grit that's, that's been sticking with me since, since I read it uh, in preparation for the winter retreat with Nick Slavic, the S painter winter retreat. And it is enthusiasm is common. Endurance is rare. Um, it's very easy to get excited about something. It's very easy to get excited about your new painting business. The ability to endure and stay on that path over a long period of time will more than likely be ultimately give you the result over that those intense compulsive cycles, right? So just stay, it's great to get excited. And that enthusiasm, that passion is what's going to drive you through, but stay focused on that goal and pursue it over a long period of time. and. If you're lucky, if you stay at it, you will probably uh, achieve mastery. I, I do want to touch on that quickly. So Jason Paris is obviously extremely successful, runs uh, a very large painting company, um, doing over $10 million a year. But it took him a long time, over, over half a decade, to break a million. And he's an introvert, and he had to go through a lot of pain to get there. He seems to uh, be kind of a weird dude in that he seems to enjoy pain. He's currently training for a 100-mile race, but he had to go through it to get there. It didn't just happen for him. It doesn't just happen for anyone. Um, so this idea that you do while being intelligent, not just pound your head into the wall over and over again for forever and hope you get there while being intelligent, there is a certain level of pain and a certain level of grit that you have to tolerate. Uh, you are choosing the road less traveled by starting and building your own business. So I think, I think that's mm -hmm. a good point. Nick, do you have anything? I appreciate you hanging with us. I know you're, you're borderline dying over here. Thank you so much for your time. Do you have any parting words? Yeah, dude. Uh, I've been holding off throwing up into my trash can in my office here, not because of the words that were spoken, but because I am physically ill at the moment. But I do appreciate talking with you and these guys so much that I was not going to miss this. So I came off the bed, put my painter face on and we did this. So you no, manned right. up, man. There it is. Love it, you, it just, hey, remember, just like we said at the retreat, it's just talking. It's just talking, you know, yeah. no. but, but, but it, 
I, I appreciate you bringing people together and having these conversations because we can get lost in what brush is best. Do you tape or not tape? What oil primer is best? And that's fine. Have those conversations. But those are the easiest solvable problems that we will ever face. These are things where you can just try stuff and get empirical data and change it. The human stuff is the squishy stuff and the weird stuff. And we need to pivot every conversation to anybody who wants to grow business to the human side and not supply chain and not coatings and things like that. And, and these guys here are doing that in a big, big way. Hmm. Guys, hey, wait, if I could just say, if yeah. I just want to say one more thing. Yeah, man. Um, first off, I don't even know what an oil primer is. So Chris Mole finished, uh, <laughs> finished his bottle of wine. Chris, Chris Mole, do you have to work tomorrow? <laughs> I win. Chris Mole wins. <laughs> <laughs> um no for real uh brandon i really appreciate what you do i it, Thanks, we, i know we make jokes about about you not um trying to pitch us on the retreat but you provided so much wisdom and insight into the marketing yeah, world yeah. um and i would encourage anyone that's listening to to reach out because brandon's brandon's a solid guy and so if have a phone conversation with him hear about what he does let him ask you what you're looking to do and he even said it today that he'll he'll let you know whether it's a good fit or not and uh, either way, you're going to get valuable information. Um, but if, if it is a good fit and he's going to work with you, you're going to make more money. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're going to get more leads. You're going to make more sales. And if you really want to grow your company, you got to invest it uh, into back into your business. And Brandon's uh, an opportunity to do that. Appreciate it, man. Well, guys, thank you. Does anyone else want to talk about how great I am? Do you guys want to go around the table? Or you guys just no, want to we had enough of that. You never give a, a, give a marketer a direct compliment to their face. That's you never way. do it. I drew I drew the short straw before we started that I was the one that had to say this. Someone right, had you, to. You, you, took, you took that one, Brad. Thank you. Yeah. Brandon, I took the time to handwrite you a note, and it's in the mail. I love it. Yeah. Did you, no did one's going to see that, Chris. No, that's not going to help his business. Chris, Chris, pro, Chris probably did do that. He, pro, I, I'm actually really excited to receive that. I bet you anything that there's, there is a letter in the yeah. mail. I'll send you a hoodie and a hat and a, and a yeah. I'll take it, man. Brandon, did, it. Brandon did send us bottles of wine for this, yeah. specifically for this. Uh, hey, who uh, won? So thank you. Who won anyways? Because uh, I do want to win. I was, I the guy, the guy I was excited for next game. days in jail one, surprisingly. Yeah, <laughs> I would say because it's a Monday night, I won. I'm too physically ill to drink alcohol tonight. So yeah. I am going to bed yeah. clean and sober and I'm going to wake up like a million bucks tomorrow. Yeah, we were going to have buddy. quite the night if, if Nick hadn't gotten sick. <laughs> oh, dude, it, that I thought you sent it to us as a challenge to see who could drink the most wine during the podcast. I was but really wasn't? looking forward to that. <laughs> to specify, I sent you guys two bottles. Like I, I was yeah. talking with Nick, like I think a week ago. I got it. And, and he said, yep, two bottles. And he said, uh, he, he, I think he saw one or, or I told him I sent a bottle of wine and, and he said, okay, great. We'll see who can, who can finish it the fastest. That'll be the game. And I was like, well, I don't, I don't think we should do that because I sent you guys each two. And he's like, is that a challenge? Challenge accepted. <laughs> That's right. So, Listen, when you, when you got guys like Chris Elliott here too, I mean, it doesn't take much to, pro to provoke or poke a couple guys like us. Like what's, what's the game? What's the challenge? Like, we'll do that. You got a bunch <laughs> of bears. <laughs> Hey, I, I, I stayed at the office to record this just so that I would not be uh, influenced to win that challenge. <laughs> but guys, thank, thank, you, thank, you, thank you for your time, guys. Yeah, thank Love you, you for, for doing this. Yeah, guys. If you want to learn more about the topics we discussed in this podcast and how you can use them to grow your painting business, visit paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast for free training, as well as the ability to schedule a personalized strategy session for your painting company. Again, that URL is paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast. Hey there, painting company owners. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Give us your feedback. Let us know how we did. And also, if you're interested in taking your painting business to the next level, make sure you visit the Painter Marketing Pros website at paintermarketingpros.com to learn more about our services. You can also reach out to me directly by emailing me at brandon at paintermarketingpros.com and I can give you personalized advice on growing your painting business. Until next time, keep growing.